Hey everybody, my name's B-Side. Welcome to the very first episode of the B-Side Me podcast. Um, super stoked to uh, have the chance to sit down with a good friend of mine, Phil Humphreys, uh, who's an amazing juggler, uh, flow artist of all sorts, graphic designer. He did the logo for this. And then, of course, uh, his amazing work for Dramatic Gems. I got to t- talk to Phil for almost two hours now, and um, it was awesome just to go over his life, how he got to where he is, and um, found it super interesting to find out in particular how basically how learning became like uh, the predominant creative force behind everything he does and how he made it systematic and, and how that's allowed him to excel in all of his art forms. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode and uh, yeah, peace. Well, might as well kick off. Hey, man. Hey, Blair. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Yeah, good. Excellent. Thanks for uh, joining me for the very first episode of Beside Me. I'm flattered, man. Very happy to be on board. Excellent. <laughs> you are, in fact, beside me, which I do like. <laughs> um, so how's 2020 thus far? Uh, it's actually 2021. 2021. Just a reality health. check for you there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Great start. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's been pretty pretty smooth so far. Just getting into the swing of it. I've yep. had um, actually pretty busy on the gig front. So, oh yeah, lots of performance kind mm-hmm. of stuff coming through, um, which has been great because it's been so quiet for so long. Um, totally due to COVID things. But I've had some. Um, in the last week, quite a few school holidays. So I've been doing school holiday programs with circus incursions. So going in and doing a little kind of performance and then uh, teaching kids. Um, in these ones, we teach them stuff like flower sticks, spinning plates and poi and hula yep. hoops and stuff like that, that they can kind of pick up yep. not, <laughs> not too uh, hard, like things like we kind of leave juggling out. Totally. So uh, for those listening, I'm a juggler <laughs> um, as long as well as like many other props. Um, as one of my little projects, I've also been just kind of getting back into the swing of uh, making jewelry, which yep. is my other my other hustle. So yep. I do wire wrapped jewelry um, with a little bit of like silversmithing and fabrication yep. techniques in there. So. Yeah, just had a little Christmas and New Year's break, which is good because I very rarely give myself a break. So I forced myself to have two weeks where I kept off, um, stayed out of the studio and kept off social media. um, Did you guys go away for New Year's, Christmas? No, we stayed around, just did family stuff, kept it pretty local. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah, it was good to take a little break, but now I've got to get back on and kind of fight the Instagram algorithm again and uh, <laughs> get yeah, the views it's back up. Changed recently? It's constantly changing. So they've they've now prioritized um popularity over time uh, over like um chronological, right? Is that maybe I, I believe that's what's happened in uh, I don't know. I think it happened a while ago, but I think they've done it even more so recently. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent. Yeah, it's always always twisting. Um, the biggest thing is engagement. Like yep. the more you're posting kind of and the more you're engaging with other people's posts is yep. kind of like boosts your engagement. So it's it's quite a lot to keep on top of. So it was pretty nice to just actually take a couple of weeks off and, and not have to worry about posting every day, figuring out when to post for different areas. Totally. A lot of my um, following is in over in the States. So yep. I've got to figure out like the best time to post through the States. And then I get messages at like all hours of the night kind of thing <laughs> coming through from yeah. the other side of the world to organize customs and, and stuff. So yep. I just kind of like, yeah, just... Had a break from everything, and it was nice to not just constantly be on the clock. Yeah, you know, <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. always the thing with your own creative business, right? Like at the end of the day, although it's, it doesn't end. <laughs> yeah, it's great to like lift off the constraints of going to work and doing the hours for someone else. But yeah, you're um, if you're anything like me, which I know you are, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're one hundred percent always on the on the mark of like thinking of the next thing you can do or the next thing you should have done yeah for sure in particular <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no it's been good i just finished off uh my first pendant that i made for the year and just kind of custom order um this one was just a just one for that's going to be available for the public mm-hmm. um last year at the end of the year i just kind of got swamped with custom so i've been buying so i, I kind of like buy 
and source like gems from all around the world to use in pieces, um, also to have available for people to choose out for customs, but just so I can, you know, when I make the pendants that I want to make, I get to kind of dig through and pick out my color palette and my yep. gems and everything. So with customs, it's I'm a little bit more limited with, you know, trying to fill the needs that somebody wants. Like somebody yep. might message me, I want, I want this crystal in a pendant. I want it yep. to be this kind of shape. So um, do, you, do they give you the idea of like the uh, crystal or like stone that they want and then you source that after that? Or I do you show them I try them and keep range? everything on hand. And I, um, so I have a pretty broad range i've dumped most of my money into crystals yep. and jewelry tools at the moment yep. pretty much but um yeah i kind of show like a little video spread of what i've got or have people around if they're local to pick stuff out um but can source stuff pretty quickly from from anywhere but yeah like for example i just got a, a customer to come through yesterday that they want like an egyptian like unk kind of symbol oh yeah unk, uh, like out of the, the the wire when yeah you make so that we'll do that of? with the wire set a little moldavite in the top circle cool. and a run of like, Is like the eye? coming down the, the no that's an eye of ra or eye of horus yep. depending if it's the left or right eye which i actually did one of those at the end of last year yeah i think i saw that yeah, yeah yeah this one's kind of like a cross um <laughs> Hey, I guess you got a camera here. It's, you know, this kind of shape here with a circle up the top. Um, yeah, so just Egyptian style kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so, and you, with specific kind of stones in there. So he wanted a Moldavite and just X gems running down the middle. So I yep. picked something out that would go with them. But it was nice having, I was saying that first piece I made, I've had been collecting all these gems ready to use and stuff, but they've just been sitting there and I haven't had time to get in there. So it was totally. nice to actually get in and pick out my own color palettes and flow and stuff. But sometimes I, sometimes I get, um, somebody will be like, I want this crystal. You can add in whatever else you want and add in like just whatever you feel works with the crystal, which yep. they're my favorite orders because yeah, I kind of okay. get to flow with it. But then I really like when somebody does give me something specific because it's kind of pushing me out of my box. Totally. Well, that's um, what I was going to ask if you had a preference because I've found even like in the past with our – Visual artists I've worked with for um, like cover covers and stuff for EPs and albums. Yeah. Um, as much as like sometimes it's been great to just be like, okay, like I know your style. Like I just want you to listen to my music and jam to it. Yeah. Um, other times they've like really like um, been so grateful for a direction. So like, and I'm never ever like it has to be like this. I'm like, this is what I have in my mind. But like, yeah. I picked you because I love what you do. Like just just do you but like they love having some form of direction and that and i mean yeah. i even feel the same way with music like when i get a stem pack or doing a remix for someone i feel like that's been some of my best work because you have a foundation like for that inspiration to begin with rather than like you know pulling from the ethos and uh looking for that inside although that is amazing too like yeah totally no i do if i'm doing a custom i do um if it's somebody that I know, if I'm making a pendant for my for a friend of mine, I kind of know their personality, and then that's really fun because I can kind of make something and be like, ah, I think you'll like this. Yeah, like, this totally. Is be cool. But if it's somebody who's just contacted me out of the blue and I have no idea what their preference is, I'll try and encourage them to, if they don't have like a specific shape or something in mind, yep. I'll encourage them to just scan through my Instagram feed or my website and have a look at my pieces and, and kind of get inspiration if there's particular elements of a piece they like, you know, because I, I try and um, have a pretty broad range of the styles that I make my pendants to try mm -hmm. and suit as many different people um, with different tastes. So I do mm -hmm. some stuff that's really kind of like techie and angular and mm -hmm. like quite like kind of cyber future kind of tech yep. style Um some, Would you say this is a good example of Yeah, this that one's kind probably a good style? example. Um, yeah, and um, this one I did for myself, so I picked yep. out a lot of uh, pretty high-end gems and slammed them yeah, up in that yeah, one, nice. so it was fun to work with. And that's kind of the style you, like, originated yeah, that's, with. that's probably, first, like, my, my yeah. favorite kind of style yeah, to cool. make. But then I do stuff for, um, you know, for just everyday people who aren't so much into, like, the... Yep. Um, abstract arts kind of scene you know, or what they want something small or simple or sometimes I'll just put the focus more on the crystal than the work around it. Yep. Sometimes I'll keep it really flowy. Yep. Um, 
But my favorite ones are the ones where I can just go super deep in like a lot of tech and it gets like each piece is kind of like its own little engineering build and it gets yeah. to a point where it's like half brain teaser, half like 3D art piece. Like, yep. Yeah, it's good fun. It's yep. good fun. Yeah. And I mean, you're obviously from your like juggling stuff, um, you've been uh, – accessing like the flow state um for a long time have you found the transfer across to this like to be uh kind of seamless i mean you've uh, I watched your progress and I- it's just <laughs> like you've just gone bang 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 with it all like and it's yeah. you know it's paid off and it has gained momentum like rather quickly i'd like to say like yeah so i like to like well first of all i very much tailor a lot of my um endeavors if you will around things that are kind of induce like in flow state inducing activities Mm -hmm. and very much like i don't necessarily like a quick fix you know i like something that's i've got to kind of get in there and um wrap my head around it and you know just um the other thing i really like is infinite progression yeah um but yeah in relation to my juggling stuff like i found that that was actually learning to juggle. So I learned to juggle um, when I was 21. Yep. So I'm now 33, I guess, 34 yep. this year. Um, and kind of through my teenage years, I always thought that um, I hated learning. Yep. Just because one, because of like the culture of the, <laughs> the, the culture that we exist in, you know, there's a very like kind of anti- um, trying sort of culture and especially like I grew up in a semi-rural area Mm -hmm. where it's it's you know in in the early 2000s kind of thing so it's very much like I'm not gonna bother trying too hard I'm just gonna do this thing kind of attitude with everything and um uh, I kind of had the same attitude through school and I didn't in like I was kind of one of those kids where the school system didn't really cater to me. So it kind of made me think that it was learning that I didn't like. Okay. And then I kind of just found the right thing for me. Yep. And, um, and I've, you know, got quite an obsessive personality with things. And I like to kind of dig deep into like the techniques, kind of the fundamentals and where you can go with it. And juggling is sort of like, it was like the perfect kind of, thing to teach me that and I try and I teach juggling um when I teach juggling I try and teach not only the process of juggling but the process of learning to people because I feel like it's the most one of the most important skills that you can have because it can be applied to anything but juggling itself is so good as an analogy for that because it's like the the initial stage of juggling you think of it as like a three ball pattern and this your base um, pattern looks like this. It's kind of yep. like an you infinity one, two, three, infinity four. symbol. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. It's called a cascade in juggling. Yep. Um, and when you're first watching juggling, you don't actually see and understand the patterns. So it's like you've got to find a level of it that your brain can understand and take in and process and then try and replicate it. So the easiest kind of thing with juggling is, okay, go with one ball yep. and, and try and wrap your head around uh, what's happening with one ball. And, you know, you can break it down as much as you want to. And yep. usually at the start, you kind of have a, a general broad kind of breakdown of it. And the more you get into it, you can refine that breakdown to yep. another level deeper and another level deeper. Totally. Um, and this is something that I really get from teaching as well. Totally. I find teaching is the best way to learn yourself because 100%. You, everybody learns in a different way. And yeah. if you want to get somebody else to understand it, you've got to find the way that they're going to understand totally. it. So you've got to think of it in a different way than you initially did. Yeah. So it's a super rewarding process for yeah. me to be teaching people. And I love it when some, but when something isn't getting through to somebody, cause yeah, I can come yeah. and be like, all right, it's a new what's challenge. happening here. I break down what they're doing. Mm-hmm. I break down where the, kind of communication error is or like their lack of understanding on it and yep. try and help them understand that particular bit yep. and come over it. And in doing so, helps me understand the general process altogether. Totally. So that's one thing. Um, with juggling, you can you can strip it down from three balls to two balls, two balls, oh, sorry, three balls to one ball, one ball to two balls and build up there. But yeah, it's I've all- I've done one and two before, but uh, just at work. Yeah, but- <laughs> and, and the other thing is to get it correctly is you're replicating a pattern. Yeah. And it just really makes you kind of, once you kind of 
can visualize and understand that pattern, mm-hmm. then you can kind of like start doing it. And to start with, you're not going to have the consistency to kind of see your own pattern. But mm-hmm. so there's obviously a little, little bit of trial and error, yep. see what works. But once you start to replicate a consistent pattern, you can then kind of kind of see where where your pattern that you're achieving is in like in a line to the pattern that you're going for. Yeah. Okay. So if you can kind of visualize your end goal yep. and then analyze your own progress to see where your pattern is to that end goal and make adjustments so it's as close to that end goal as you can. Yeah. It leads to very fast progression in whatever you're doing. So totally. I kind of do the same thing now with anything. I look for patterns. I look for like the the elements that like the individual elements that go into something to create a whole piece and then yep. I try and like refine those bits and I look at where my progress is going to like where I want to be. Yep. Um, but it all kind of stems from having that understanding and taking the time to break down the end result, like what yep. your your desired achievement. Yep. And taking that into like um, I guess steps that are appropriate for your level of understanding of it. Yep. So another thing that comes into play with with learning is it's like you want something that's going to be challenging enough that it's going to pique your interest yep. and keep you kind of wanting to, you know, pick it up and keep on going and, and keep on going. Because if it's too easy, you're going to get bored with it pretty quickly. And if it's too difficult and outside of your understanding of it, you're also going to get too bored because it's going to go over your head and you'll be like, oh, this is too much and you get overwhelmed and you'll put it down. So you need that engagement. There's an optimal learning space in between there. And so to anybody who wants to learn anything, that's the first step is figuring out what what your step one is. So strip it right back, find the step one, the introductory level of it. And then if you find that you already kind of are comfortable with that, then look for the intermediate, then advanced. But if you just kind of go head in, yeah. you'll probably burn out and it will get too overwhelming. And if you, um, yeah, so just find the right level of learning for you. But totally. But in terms of like my progress in that, I like I feel like I am lucky to have that understanding of the learning process yeah. that then I can apply to whatever I'm doing. And mm. usually... Um, get into it pretty good. And of course, having that obsessive personality really helps and patience. Yeah. Um, some other things that I pull, you know, that I swing into my juggling workshops in terms of like life lessons yeah. in the learning process. And again, juggling just provides the perfect analogy for it because yeah. it's like expect to drop, you know, expect to make mistakes. That's yeah. part of the process. If you're not dropping, then um, it's too easy for you. You, yeah. you, you're not at that optimal learning well, you're not, process. And you're not pushing yourself That's to... That's it, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. The, the fine space. And it's a it's a um, ever-changing fine space That's too, it. right? Yeah, as you totally. Go. Yeah. yeah, so um, the stuff that you were dropping as you were dropping, yeah, yeah. depending on what you're learning, it might not be a drop. It might be a, a complete kind of... If I'm making jewelry, I might have to scrap a whole component I'm working yeah. on and start again. But it's like I'll take something away from that and I'll be like, sweet, I know not to do that in my next one. I'll progress in it and um, ultimately become better at it on the other end of it rather than I, I very um, seldom beat myself up for making a mistake. I try yeah, and find that's a, good. a way to learn from it. It's a hard it. thing to get to. Yeah, that's totally. <laughs> we, we all do, myself included, like all of the time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I, I kind of like just... You know, more so I embrace it. I'm yeah. like, cool, all right, this is this is keeping me on my toes. I've got to rethink this. I've got to like understand it better or take my time when I'm doing it a little more, make sure I'm not rushing it, you know, just a reminder. Mm-hmm. I like to kind of work um, pretty thoroughly and slowly. Yep. Especially, and, you know, especially when I'm in, in flow state because I can just – Headphones in, noise cancelling headphones. I feel like good y- your idea of working slowly <laughs> might be different from other people. <laughs> yeah. But then that also then retracts back to like the obsessive thing because that's um, it. Yeah. In regards to like for you saying that like your time, I mean like the the time to end product for you, um, you know, from me from a, a outside perspective, I'm only seeing you post thing after thing after thing after thing and yeah. like in a very like what I feel like is a short time in regards to your um, uh, jewelry making in particular. Um, but for you, like behind each piece is what like 
10, 12, yeah, 24 it can hours anywhere. more. Like I, can, I can bang out a simple piece in a couple of hours, like a, a simple piece. But um, if I was to do it messy, you know, I could do it in, in, in a less, like a shorter amount of time. But, you know, I, I like to make sure that every kind of curve is right, every angle is right. So it's like, depends on your level of attention to detail as For to sure. how much time. But some of my bigger pieces, yeah, it's, you're looking at probably like 20 to 30 hours. Yep. Um, plus depending on how big the piece is because yep. it's like I can have a piece that may be the same size but then I can have like three or four times the amount of depth of work within that piece kind of thing yep. or detail. Um, Do you have a singular piece going at each time? Like you work on one piece to its finish? Do you have three or four on the fly always? Like I, I, try, and, I try and like see a piece through from like idea to yeah. um, completion. Um, unless I'm working on a piece that's just kind of going into my available stock and I get a customs request gone through, okay. I'll try and like if you someone especially if the it's- business. Yeah, especially if it's time specific, like time- um, sensitive i'll try totally. and bang it out and, and hit a deadline for somebody totally um keep the customers happy you know and yeah. it feels it feels good as well to to do that and um yeah but it definitely is a lot of time but in in terms of like taking my time to do it um and even in the learning process um relaying back to juggling theory so another thing um I, I, I juggle multiple props. So yep. by juggling, you know, I've got juggling balls, clubs, Balls were strings. your first? Balls were my first, yeah. Yep. Uh, contact juggling, I do Diablo, yep. contact poi, um, yep. a bit of everything else kind of at a reasonable level, but they're probably the ones that I've delved deepest into. For sure. But um, contact juggling, um, palm spinning in specific, uh, in specifically, which mm. is... You've kind of got single ball contact juggling, which is your bigger ball, yep. doing more like body rolls and isolation stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but palm spinning is like multi ball contact juggling, where you've got often um, three, four, or six. Yeah, you're doing the round. And the you're circle. doing yeah, like everybody. Yeah, yeah. Everybody thinks of um, the labyrinth is most people's kind okay. of reference of contact juggling. Yep. Um, like the movie? Yeah, yeah. the movie. Okay. I hadn't actually I seen, seen it, seen but every it. every time it was David Bowie. Okay. Um, so every time I'd be palm spinning in public, people would be like, "Ah, oh, David Bowie, the labyrinth." Uh. And I'm like, "Who's <laughs> your pal? I haven't seen it." Ah, that's <laughs> but cool. yeah, it's actually fun fact. It looks like David Bowie um, contact juggling, but they've actually got a stunt double. Uh, he, he puts his arms around him, and he's ah. like wearing gloves. And yeah, that's they cool. do it. It's, it's it's camera tricks, but yeah. um. For me, it's yeah. like the moment you say contact jungle or any <coughs> kind of circus thing. For me, in particular, uh, Woodford. Yeah, it's just yeah. Like, but I was fortunate enough to grow up in that space, and yeah, so nice. you yeah. know, I grew up watching like Terry and that. So, oh, yeah, like, totally. yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but the lesson from contact juggling, especially palm spinning, there's like you can spend. So you, the the essential um, idea of it is spinning two balls around in your palm, kind of like also Chinese meditation balls, kind of thing. But the idea is you want to keep them kind of like on a flat surface so they're even the entire time. Yep. And every time they clink together and make a sound, it means you've got a slight error in your technique. So like a gap between them and that's, yeah, that's they're, them they're making coming gap off and because you want them to be touching perfectly the yeah, whole way. Yeah, so, so. so the idea is to train to keep your, the balls on a flat like kind of even surface mm -hmm. to, to each other. So rather than having the balls sitting on your hand, which is an uneven surface, yep. you have to <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I got a tickle in my throat. I haven't You're talked right. this much for a while. You're all right. Um, water you away to, whenever you want. You've got to learn to basically m get your hands in a position around the ball yep. to keep the balls even in all these different um, orientations of the circle. So you can sit there and spend an hour each day just spinning them around in a circle. <coughs> and hope for improvement mm -hmm. or you can spend one hour kind of you go like two positions in your hand yeah Hang on. <clears throat> yeah you're good bro and yeah, my voice is going <laughs> that's all right i uh talk for a living so <clears throat> i can easily take over whenever you want yeah <laughs> so um yeah the 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 kind of takeaway from this is you can spend an hour just spinning them around in mm -hmm. your hand or you can take an hour getting used to each position and breaking it down, start okay. in like two positions and then break it down into four positions, then into eight positions 
Okay. And there's actually 32 positions of the circle wow. around your hand where yeah. you can figure out where to exactly have your hand position. So your so hand the is flat. Like, uh, <clears throat> like so slightly like altering yes. um, its, uh, I don't know what you want to say, fine, surface? Fine muscle, fine, fine muscle control in different areas of your hand. Okay, I never so, really thought about it like that. I thought it was all in your fingers. Yeah, it's your, it's your whole hand and yeah. the area, like moving your hand around. And so the takeaway is if you spend an hour doing that slowly, then you'll learn it quickly. Yeah. Whereas if you try and just go into it and bang, 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 do circles Find and hope that memory. it's going to get better, yeah. then you're actually building incorrect muscle memory. Yeah, okay, and then which you, is harder to get out that's of. That's it. It's, yeah. it's Sometimes it's easier to teach somebody something who's never tried it because it's easier to build muscle memory mm. than it is to break it and rebuild it. Yeah. Really, really hard to teach somebody juggling if they've got kind of like um, incorrect muscle memory built in. For sure. And, you know, all that comes down to how much you want to get into it, you know. Yep. If you just want to do it as something to um, exercise and just something to fill your time with and you're not too concerned on the absolute deep tech of it, then, yep. you know, you learn it to that level. But if you if you do have that kind of obsessive personality and the thirst for progression... Um, then take your time to learn it properly and you'll learn quicker. So, yep. And that's why it's, it's a funny thing, like learning it slower will make you learn it quicker. Yeah, okay. And so I try and like really have that level of attention to detail when I'm learning everything. Yep. So I, I've learned so many lessons through this process of like totally. my juggling journey. Yeah, wow. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, that's like super interesting because, you know, I know that like you switched from being primarily a performer and running Juggle Hut mm. to uh, your prime business is uh, Gemmatic now. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and obviously that progression was amazing. But yeah, it's really nice to hear that like, you know, even in you talking throughout this so far, um, it all stems back to that. Yeah. It all comes back from its original place, like what the 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 original tick was for you. Like yeah. you said, you didn't find your thing until you found juggling, but it all comes back to that. And the fact that um, you know, through that process you've um you've learned the the breakdown, as you said, and like you've just basically explained uh, well, like giving us an example of exactly what you explained before, yeah. where you've then taken it down to its individual form uh, or its individual p positions and really broke it down, like, yeah, um, which I think is really cool. Like, and that's yeah, that's cheers. interesting, just um, uh, just such an interesting way of looking at it. And like, it makes total sense to me now, like, how I've seen your progression in so many different art forms, um, where c considering your first art form is, um, like juggling, but more so learning. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, totally. and, which is really cool. Uh, do you, would you say, would you attribute the fact to that? Because um, from what I remember of previous conversations with you, you said you got into juggling on Hamilton Island. Daydream Island. Daydream yeah. Island. Yeah. And then not that long afterwards, you were approached by the person to start doing the workshops at schools, workshop slash performance. Yeah, totally. Um, would you attribute like that quick progression between like it, uh, its um, beginning to teaching? Like, it, like wasn't that long between um, the two? You know, a lot yeah, of people spend five helps. years before so, they teach. Like, yeah. So I guess I guess um, I say kind of like juggling was my, my first thing, but that was that was like my first thing that really gave me that passion that I knew that was what I wanted to do as a career. Mm -hmm. um, but I did have a couple of things growing up as a teenager. Um, I got really, really into skateboarding. Yep. So that was my first kind of like obsessive thing. Cool. I'd get home and, um, and I guess I just also had a lot of just other random things that I was into. I was also from an even young age, very into drawing. Yep. And um, I kind of had the perfect storm of things going on within my own uh, interests that really helped me in that learning kind of understanding uh, movement mm -hmm. as well, which really comes, uh, really comes into um, learning, especially physical based mm -hmm. things. Um, so through drawing, I was very interested in uh, animation. Mm -hmm. And so I remember even back when I was 12, like grade seven, I can remember that was when I was first getting into skateboarding and it was back in the time of like skateboarding magazines. And yep. they used to have like the 
I was a skater um, kid too. Yeah, so yeah. Um, before YouTube, you know, um, if you wanted to show movement of a trick in a magazine, you have the 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 frame by frame kind of mm, sequence in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And so I used to like study those to learn my uh. tricks and um, getting into animation. I used to make little flip books yeah. in, in class. Totally. And I draw little skaters. And so like from studying kind of the the frame by frame sequencing of what was happening at every kind of part of the body – to be able to draw it and recreate it gave me a very good understanding of that kind of frame by frame breakdown of movement to like a fine um, kind of point sort yeah. of thing every little bit. So that kind of perfect storm of all my interests really gave me that understanding of of movement and how to apply that. Yeah. Um, well, wow, that's that's really cool. Like, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, even just like as you said, the skate mags. Like, oh, I totally remember. And they had, you know, originally it was like frame by frame and then eventually they like had all the stitched photos where you could like go all the way along in the same um in the same picture obviously yeah Yeah. so that that originally kind of like got me like taught me how to learn myself yeah just kind of that analyzing other other movement that's like that like i was saying the desired result of a professional doing it to where i am and like how it's going but like understanding the movement because if you don't have a good understanding of it, it's very hard to replicate it to totally. a high level, right? Yeah, Which yeah. is where most people kind of will try something out and then they'll give up because they haven't really broken down the steps to get there. Yeah. Um, but so I started that and I was, you know, teaching my friends how to skate. And then I got really, really into volleyball through school. So, mm-hmm. um, and I had a really good um, coach. So he was really good in his... Um, teaching process in an in-depth level, Mm -hmm. which I picked up on that as well. I kind of, from that, having an analytical brain, analyzed almost his teaching style. And then like I was learning, I ended up getting to kind of like a representative level of volleyball. So I used to play, um, represent Queensland actually. So I went to nationals a couple of times for volleyball. Yeah. yeah. Um, So then ended up teaching um, like coaching volleyball uh, okay. from the age of 15. So yeah. when I was 15, I used to teach like the grade eights and yeah. kind of from there. And then my first job out of school actually was the official like volleyball coach out of school. So I used to teach the senior teams um, when I was fresh out of school kind of thing. So yeah. all that came into like teaching practice and it all kind of swelled together um, into like my ability to, to kind of teach and break down and find ways to explain things to people to learn. Totally. But career wise, I was sort of at a point where I was like, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, I was really into art. I was really into sport and really into music. And cause I played guitar as well from cool. kind of like 15 onwards. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I kind of didn't really know what direction I wanted to go in. Went to TAFE for animation for a little bit, but cool. was fresh out of school and still in that phase where I like didn't like apply myself for learning things. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and then it was it was juggling that switched my brain for that, where I was like, all right, give me all the information. I'm going to learn things in depth. I'm going to read. I'm going to watch yeah, classes awesome. and like do what I can to kind of. Well, it's such you a f- get that to anything. I, I find it so interesting because it's such a like fun balance between all of those things, like that uh, yeah, you've actually, enjoyed that was, from that was, the beginning. That was going to be my next point. I'm like, ranting and forgetting. No, all it's of this. cool. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I ended up going to Daydream because I I didn't finish the TAFE course I was doing. I I was studying animation, but didn't even have a computer at home at the time. Like okay, I yeah. chose to move out and was like living with some friends down the Gold Coast, yeah. and we were like just partying down there at the As time. You do. And that kind of <laughs> took priority, and then ended up um, just quickly on the animation thing. Did you did you find that um, like was that it was their teaching approach, or was, uh, you know it was a combination of things? Obviously, I, I think the it time was place as yeah, well. Yeah, I think it was more so. It was right at the switch. You know, this would have been two thousand and five. Yeah, and it was right at the switch where everything was kind of going from. Um, kind of hand-drawn stuff to digital yep. primarily quite a lot. And so um, I would really liked dr- just drawing kind of cartoons back in high school. Yep. I very much changed my artistic style now. Yep. Um, but back then um, I was kind of 
more, I guess, drawn to it from the the hand drawn side of it, and then just kind of um, that was very re- repetitive kind of thing, and it was kind of making the switch into a lot more computer based stuff, but the technology wasn't there at the time to be able to just like draw something on a computer and have it, or it was, it was there, but very expensive and kind of like, you know, at, at its early rudimentary stages. So it was kind of like switching over to some, um, I guess like there was 3d animation, there was flash animation at the time, which is completely gone now. Flash animation oh, really? doesn't exist anymore. So it was just kind of like, it was more so just a thing where I was going to, I picked picked it to go to school, like after school, you know, like um, be, just because it was expected for you to go and do more education when you finish school. And I, I wasn't in the mindset to do that. So I didn't take advantage of it. Of course. If I, I, I'd love to go back and kind of do it again right now, but you know, it's just one, one more thing that <laughs> I, I got to, I got to pick and choose my, my avenues I pursue, but I get but, that bro. <laughs> yeah. But if, if I were to do the same course with the, the, the mindset I had, even from a couple of years later, and you know, that comes just from growing up a little bit, but also just from the, the switches I had in my own kind of internal growth and and mindset and the way yeah. I ch- have chosen to live my life now compared to when I was a kid. Basically. For sure. So, but I, yeah, that's that's why I, I didn't pursue agree. it at the time, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I ended up just I uh, had an opportunity to go up to Daydream Island, and I got a job doing activities up there, which was a great gig because of all my like sporting background. Yep. It was good to kind of go in and do that. And I basically spark my memory. Where exactly is Daydream Island? Daydream Island. Island <laughs> um, it's in the Whit Sundays. Um, yep. The closest island to Ellie Beach. So okay. Great Barrier Reef. Yep. The Whit Sundays is a group of, if I remember correctly, seventy two islands. And okay. there's maybe so like the, six Hamilton or seven. Island would be a part of that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's maybe All six right, or okay. seven islands up there that have resorts on there. Hamilton's the most known and it's kind of like Ham- if you think of Hamilton as like an island with almost like a town yeah. there with different resorts and different kind of shops and businesses and stuff there. Daydream was you just had the island that just had the resort on it. Yeah, so okay. We had like there was like the main island up the the north end and then the south end was kind of like half guests and then down the very tip of the south end was the staff village. Okay. So it was like the old resort from yep. the 70s. You lived in there, shared accommodation. Yep. So it was a it was a grand old time. We had a little staff bar and stuff. What pool. was your job? Activities. So oh, I'd, Okay, all right. Yes, I'd, you um, did say that. Yeah. I do the guest activities each day. So awesome. I go around and like um, 10 a- start at 10 a.m. with aqua aerobics, jump in, and like nice. just do aqua aqua aerobics, then like beach volleyball. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like I had a, a, an activities list of like um, every hour there'd be an activity and guests could show up and I yep. just kind of have like facilitate them for the guests. So we did the guest activities. We did non-motorized water sports. So we just sit in a little little hut on the beach and, yep. and hire out catamarans and kayaks and yep. get a little briefing and cool. send people on their way. And then in the same department, we had a little mini golf hut cool. where we just hand out, sit in the hut, hand out clubs and balls. Yep. So this all comes into um, how I found juggling because yeah, awesome. as a um, – as like a, one of the activities, my manager basically had a catalog of things he could get in and he had like a little circus pack that he could get in as one of the activities. Mm-hmm. And I'd tried like um, basic kind of single fire stuff before and was like, oh, that's awesome. So I was like, cool, I'll like um, that seems related. I'd love to kind of take that on board. And he kind of like, we agreed that I'd bring it up as part of the activities thing and I'd be in charge of that. And so we do like a little circus school kind of thing. So cool. the night before my first circus school thing was scheduled, we got an activities pack in and somebody showed me just kind of basic three ball stuff. Yeah. And I kind of learned that and then was just teaching it the next day kind of thing. And like wow. always trying to stay a step ahead and teaching basic things. <laughs> my partner's just driven up. Nice. <laughs> um, so yeah. you picked up um, the three ball overnight. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, that just comes come, comes through to like just having that perfect storm of And your motor skills and, from volleyball and yeah, all the things, even skateboarding. Leading up towards that like, and just the understanding of movement totally. and, and physical kind of um, motion and understanding. And yeah, the coordination from doing all that stuff. Yeah. Um, hey, beggar. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, from that, and this was like before the times of iPhones. I had like, I think a, a little flip phone that I could maybe access the internet on, but we had like, not even. Yeah, not much. So I hadn't <laughs> even really been exposed to much juggling before, but totally. um, I had a friend who lived on the mainland and we used to go out in Early Beach and then come back to his place and just sometimes if it was a big night, you know, we'd have a few hours until the first ferry back to the back to the island. So we'd just, he had the internet. So we'd, we'd I'd YouTube Cirque du Soleil videos and other juggling videos and be like, man, juggling is awesome. Why have I not seen this before? Yeah, awesome. And just got super obsessive with it and would try and remember the stuff I'd watched um, like at my friend's place and then try and learn that um, on the island. And I was lucky enough that in my role as activities, because juggling was a part of that, if it was quiet on the island, so in off season, mm -hmm. sometimes I'd have people not showing up for activities and I'd have an hour before my next activity. So I was like, sweet, juggle, juggle, juggle. If we were at the water sports hut and maybe like the, the conditions weren't right for people to want to go out or if it was a quiet day, you might have a whole shift and maybe have 10 people come through. So I was like, juggle, 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 yeah. juggle. And same with mini golf. Yeah. Sometimes if it was slow oh, yeah, season, mini man, golf master, right? you'd, well, no, I juggle. At mini oh, golf, you right? juggle. Yeah, so they're, they're always like, Take a magazine, course, take yeah. a magazine down a mini golf to keep yourself entertained. Because yeah. when it's slow, there's not a lot to do. You totally. just got to basically go down, and hit the mini golf course with a blower, um, blow the leaves off, and then your job is sit there and wait for people to show up. Yeah, true. And so they're like, "Yeah, take a magazine." I was like, "Sweet, I'm taking juggling balls." Yeah. And so I'd have an eight-hour shift where I was just juggling basically all day, and then I'd finish my shift and then go home and juggle with my friends who I was also getting on board with it. So I was just juggling all the time. Yeah. So like I said, super obsessive. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> but, um, but that's it as well. Like it's uh, finding um, those times that like in your daily activity, because, you know, a lot of us do the grind. Yeah. Um, but in between the grind, like I've considered starting to try um, like just some basic contact ball stuff at my yeah, job yeah. Uh, in between phone calls because, you know, there there's a lot of spare time where I'm just sitting there. Um, yeah. And uh, but like I think back to like a correlation to my own art form, like people used to ask me like how'd you get good at like freestyling when I used to do that more how'd you get good at um at beatboxing and when I worked at the casino like I ran I ran a lobby bar where on the weekend I'd serve two people in an eight hour yeah. shift <laughs> so I'd just sit behind that bar and just beatbox and just beatbox and beatbox and then put a tune on and just like freestyle and rap to myself or yeah, write nice. stuff down and it's it's finding those in-between moments um of your daily grind and the hustle um to like to excel at what like what really you know brings you passion and joy yeah totally yeah. totally and and then even even if you are work like if you have a job that you don't have the chance to do that yeah just finding out things that you do when you get home that because and i know this if you are working and you get home and you're like oh man i'm wrecked there's no way i'd pick up some juggling balls now and, and or like whatever the skill is you're trying to learn and do it but if you can get over that mental block of being like, I'm too tired, I'm going to just watch yeah. TV and relax. Because you might think I'm if you, if you count it. the hours that you sit there watching <laughs> totally, um, and even just take one of those a day. And, and in those states where you are too tired, once you get into it, and especially if it's a flow state oh, yeah. in, just, invoking shh. activity, then you that gives you a burst of energy. And For then sure. you find something that you might have been like, oh man, I might be able to give it. 10 minutes, if you push past to 20 minutes, then yeah. the next thing you know, it's an hour, it's two hours, it's three hours. And yeah. you're like, oh, sweet, I got a good session, made some good progression. Totally. Oh, it's the minimum um, expectation rule too, right? Like I do that sometimes yeah. with producing. I'm like, okay, like I don't want, like I don't want to do anything right now, but I tell you what, I'm going to just sit down and start something yeah, um, or look over something or whatever. And, you know, sometimes I will try and try and try and I can't get past the loop or my brain's just not in it. And I like, I spend, like maybe 20 half an hour on it or, or however long and then i go okay you gave it a go today yeah let's start fresh tomorrow and then other times i start it thinking that i'm gonna do that exact method like for tap out in half an hour and five hours goes by and you can't pull me away from it yeah right but that i guess like that's the other thing as well you do have to um be able to understand when you do have those days where you mm. do just want to chill yeah um and not beat and yourself give, up over it yeah and give your body that allow yourself to do it but don't let it become a habit every day totally yeah yeah so 
getting back into yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. like because you you brought up how I um, got into it as a career and yeah, so yeah um, I was really like again it's just kind of things fell into place once I learned juggling I was like cool I want to I'd love to be able to travel and go around and teach people juggling um, and I was just lucky enough that I was um, when I was on the island. Um, I met a couple who were there on holidays and um, this was the the business I started working for. Yeah, um, so cool. Circus Challenge is the name of the, the company and it yeah. was just run by a couple. Um, and the guy who started it, he was doing kind of like all the bookings and everything himself and going out and doing all the shows and everything. And they were touring through actually and had a bit of time off. So came out to the island and saw me juggling and we got to chatting and uh, one thing led to another and he was pretty much saying that eventually he'd be looking to um, kind of start to scale and step back into more of like a managing from home sort of thing and okay. having a, a team on the road. Yeah, doing so, touring. so he was doing it originally. He was, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of um, all ended up – I kind of changed islands, went to Brampton Island after that and got a really good job, basically went there saying, hey, I juggle, give me a job. And I went there and I was like, they've created a department for me called entertainment. Yeah, awesome. And I do just like juggling. Just like little shows stuff and, and stuff. a couple of other things tied in there, which yep. is pretty cool. And then at the time when I was ready to leave that, um, yeah, I had an email sitting in my inbox. Again, this was like the time where I had to actually go to the staff canteen and yeah, find, yeah. use the computers there to check my emails. Yeah. And when I was actually going to go and email him to see if like when he would be available, I had an email sitting in there saying like, do you want to come on tour next year and um, do this? So it was just perfect timing. Yeah, awesome. Um, and yeah, he kind of trained me up. And, um, so you toured with him in the beginning? So we spent – he flew out um, – he, he kind of pitched the idea to me and then um, I was off the island at this point and I'd called a friend of mine because it was like a two-person gig. So, yep. we kind of asked if I had anybody I wanted to do it with and I called a really good friend of mine who was kind of like one of my friends from the island who also got on board with juggling mm -hmm. and so we'd juggle all up there. And uh, One quick second. Whoop. We've lost the camera. One second. Pause. Is it going flat? Back in business. All right. For anyone watching out there. <laughs> I wonder how much we missed. This is the first <laughs> one and there's going to be um, black sections, but I'll fill them in with fun footage of you juggling or something. <laughs> <laughs> Our most goofy faces. Though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. We'll do one of those. Yeah. Uh, like, technical uh, issues. Technical issues. Please hang <laughs> Please by. Please yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but um, the audio is still going. So, yeah, all cool. is well. So, kicking back in. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I called up my friend at the time and was like, "Hey, man, I uh, hadn't spoken to him for a little bit. I was like, what are you what are you up to these days?'" And he then found himself back down in Sydney doing um, door to door sales for like an insulation company. Mm. And I was like, "Cool, that sounds all right. How would you like to maybe come on tour around <laughs> Australia and New Zealand <laughs> teaching circus tricks to kids?" And he's yeah. like, uh, "Yes." Uh, so I'm <laughs> working in sales currently. I can understand how that would be an inviting invitation. Yeah. So so um, basically, he flew up from Sydney to Brisbane, um, and our the the guy who ran the company flew over from Perth where he lived and mm -hmm. met up with us and just kind of we had a big meeting about what it entailed and. He gave us some gear and showed us some basics on a few different props and gave us some stuff to practice. And then we met up again in like a, a month or two after that uh, down in Melbourne, I think, and started, um, yeah, so we all flew to Melbourne and watched him do a couple of shows. So do the show and then do the workshops and see kind of how he ran it. Yeah. And we spent, I think, three shows with him and then we started to kind of like do some of the workshop stuff with him and stand in. And then um, the plan was he was flying back to Perth. We flew to Adelaide. We had like 
a week to kind of practice and get the show together. Then he he actually got a a brand new like Honda I load for us to tour in. So he went and got that from Perth, drove it over to Adelaide to meet us, and he, we were going to watch him do a few more shows and start like weaning us into it. Mm-hmm. And then we were going to take over the tour. And we'd been in Adelaide for a few days and he called, he's like, so the van's not ready yet and we've got these schools booked on Monday. So we can either postpone them or if you're feeling up to it, you can just go in and and try and do it. And we're like, sweet, let's do it. Yeah, nice. (laughs) And so we did these shows super unprepared and it was one of those things where it was like- Two feet first. Yeah, we had mistakes, but it worked and you know, they don't know the things you For example. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, just threw ourselves in the deep end and, and then that was kind of it. And it was a um, really awesome experience. So basically we'd we'd pretty much get a, a, an itinerary for the month sent to us and then um, all our accommodation and travel paid for, um, got the van and just we'd, we'd either stay in motels or uh, in like cabins in caravan parks quite yep. a lot. Or, um, we did a lot of rural work, yep. went out to kind of smaller communities where they didn't get incursions coming out and they usually had to get all the kids on a bus and take them to the city, right? Yep. So they loved it. Did everything from like massive, massive schools with big shows and um, to like the smallest school they ever did was to an audience of like nine kids. Wow. <laughs> yeah, super cute and they were all related and like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. <laughs> Where was that? Like in Western Australia or, like, um, or just the that central, one, central that Australia? That one was actually kind of out in like central New South Wales. Yeah. Um, out there, like kind of farming communities. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I got to see, very, very thankful for that experience oh, of yeah. how much of the country I got to see. We did all of Australia and New Zealand except for Northern Territory just because yeah. it was a little too. Oh, you too, did NZ too. Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah. Did maybe like four or five NZ trips cool. um, and even like through the same company, even got to go over and do some stuff in Cambodia with some um, cool uh, centers over there, like yep. some orphanage centers yep. um, working with a, with an organization called Transform Cambodia. And they had like, I think 13 different centers around Phnom Penh where they got kids yep. from the slums and basically gave them schooling and education and stuff. So we did some things in the individual centers and they had a big conference where they got all of them together and we did a big show for I think it was like it was like a hundred kids in each center so like 12 or 1300 kids kind of thing all together and we yep. put on a big day of activities and a show for them so yep. it took me to some really cool places and did some really cool things so I was super grateful to have that experience and also like learning how to perform from mm, yep. from um Clinton is the the guy's name and yep. um he's great um had a really kind of good business sense and um, he was kind of like, a, he used to do busking from a young age. So kind of had like a busking style yep. elements in the show, which is very different to a lot of the performances I do now. So now I do, I still do, um, I've actually just started working with Clinton again, just oh, recently really? doing school shows again, um, but all based around Brisbane. Cool. And that's um, that's who you were referring to at the beginning of the, um, uh, when we started chatting uh, that you did some like yeah, workshops and stuff? Yeah, I, I have a few different um, people that book me out for things. And I that's do some I stuff through. I um, originally going to ask about active skills, obviously. Yeah, so a- through a good friend of mine, Ben, um, runs a, a program called Active Skills and we've been trying to build up our own program, taking all the things from I learnt I learned from that and ways that we could kind of better it and deliver a, yep. a program of yep. our own kind of thing. Um I saw that he uh has recently up done his the Facebook. Yeah, yeah, it's so, looking good. Check out you, check you out have. Active Skills on, <laughs> on Instagram. Yep. Um I think I think PJ's behind the social uh, media course, stuff is his wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um good. Excellent. But, but yeah, so it's it's all great stuff. So I'm I'm really stoked that there's a few people trying to push it because it's great stuff to get the kids out there. One, because it's totally. great skills to learn, but I really like I said, I really just go in there and try and push like, you're going to make mistakes. It's part of the learning process. Don't get upset with yourself. Just have fun with it have and keep on going. It. Yeah. Some of the stuff I'm going to give you is easy. Some of it's going to be really hard. So expect not to get it. Totally. It's, kids don't like have that ingrained in them. And one thing I, I really um, used to see because Actually, I'll come back to this because this is kind of like another chapter. I was going to get into Juggle Hut stuff, which is a completely new thing. Um, That was kind of like the three sort of chapters I had in my head anyway. So So, so back in the the workshops, I work at the moment, I'm doing stuff for, um, 
Yeah, active skills is mainly like holiday programs. Circus challenge is more in school term incursions. Circus challenge is Clinton's is one. Clinton. Um, I work for another friend of ours called Josie, who she runs a um, puzzle dust circus, and she gets me more of my performance based stuff. So okay. this week I've had some like roving juggling stuff, which is just kind of going to a couple of events and juggling and just. Yeah, smiling at people and showing them some cool tricks in totally. between whatever the events got going on. And also do other corporate events through her. So like big corporate events, we'll do fire shows or LED shows yep. or uh, weddings and whatever comes through really. Totally. So they're kind of the three different branches. But the the corporate event slash fire show, um, even like festival performance stuff is so different to the style of show that I do in schools. Mm -hmm. So completely different techniques and like, it's very, very interesting to learn every kind of like both aspects of that. What's engaging for yeah, the yeah. different audiences. Yeah, because um, a fire regard. show, you just get up there and you do your show. It's, it's choreographed to music. You've got no, you, you're not talking at all. It's very kind of like more theatrical kind of, uh, yeah based around you know you've also got fire so people are just like ooh fire and <laughs> they're very engaged the whole time just with that whereas if you're doing um like the school based show I do is a lot of talking and kind of like it's got a it's got a structure but a massive element of improv in there yep um and with the talking do you mean in regards to a like are you explaining what you're doing or you're being a silly no, goose yeah sort of the second one it's sort of the second <laughs> yeah, one cool. so it's um <laughs> When we do, when I do I like expected. a when I do a fire <laughs> show, it's usually like a ten or ten to twelve minute show, and you just go out there, smash it out. But when I do a school show, and back when we were touring, it was it was pretty much like a a thirty minute to an hour long show. Yeah. Um. So you can't just fill it out with tricks, 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 or you'll die. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up, you'll die. Um. So um. You know, you've got to one kind of get in there, build the hype with the audience first of all. So you've got like your hype building session mm -hmm. and then you've got like your opening routine, which is like bang, 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 high energy. And then you've got your things where you've got like audience participation, like get kids up out of the audience, include them into it, then more routine. And then like finish off with something impressive, usually like get a teacher up out of the audience, have a little like embarrass the teacher kind of thing, yep. get some street cred with the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, Pass clubs around the teacher or something like that. So, so many elements. It's it's a lot more interactive and yep. a lot more kind of like way more like jokes and stuff. And because yep. I was doing shows with another person, a lot of improv back and forth. Like sometimes we'd throw a lot of stuff in there to just kind of keep each other on our toes because yep. sometimes it was like a simple structure. We had another show that was a lot more story-based. We were kind of like two chefs and it was yeah, like cool. we, we were trying to – it was like a – Selling like a healthy eating through juggling kind of cool. uh, message. So we do things where like we made a bunch of props with say like one example of a of a, a, a gag in there was like we made some cupcakes that we could juggle and then um, I was like a new chef that came in. My buddy Richie <laughs> was like the this French waiter. He's not French but put on a cheesy yeah. French accent. <laughs> he was like the waiter owner of the restaurant and I was like trying to – he was trying to teach me about healthy eating, but by teaching the kids kind of thing. So it was yeah, like yeah. I'd start by juggling cupcakes and we'd do like a stealing and replacing thing where you'd like steal one cupcake out, replace it with an apple. And so essentially you go from juggling cupcakes to juggling apples kind of thing. And that's yep. kind of the message all the way through the show with a bunch of cheesy gags like that. Yep. Juggling different kitchen chef-based props. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so a lot of fun. Nice. And, and and when you've got like, so that one had a semi-script, but we were very loose with it. And we're just throwing a lot of improv just, just to keep it interesting for ourselves, you know, totally. when you're doing the same show five days a week. Totally. Um, so we, yeah, we'd, we'd do shows five days a week, go to a different school every day, wow. either have like, I reckon on average, we'd have about three hours travel to the next school. Um, okay. Some days we'd have like a few schools in the, like we wouldn't have to travel. We'd have a few schools in the same area. Some days we'd finish an entire school day and then have to drive 10 hours to get to the True. next place. So it was, it was hard work. It was like. So he's, a, he'd established this kind of roster yeah. over a long period of time. Yeah. Did he double down on like the level of, um, the amount of schools he was able to uh, obviously cross because he was no longer doing the performances as well. Like he was able to run the admin side. Like, um, he do actually, you know if the he, program became more or? He had a pretty solid, he'd already been doing it for, his, I think, five years or so okay, yeah, beforehand yeah. and he had a pretty substantial um, 
booking system. So cool. it was pretty much full all year round. We did come up with more things to do um, during school holidays. Yep. So, for example, and this, <laughs> this is just another kind of part of the story, we set up a little circus-themed action park down in this space in Dunsborough, which is um, Margaret River Way, so about like three and a half hours southwest of Perth yep. on like the on the coast there, a little beach town. So we set up, it was tourist town, so only busy through kind of holiday season. So we set it, got like Clinton went out and, and sourced a big inflatable like tightrope and trapeze kind of rig and we got a bunch of like Zorb balls and things um, and set all them up and basically made a big um, circus themed action park kind of thing that kids could go just to kind of keep us going. So through that started doing more like after school sessions in that one area. So I could kind of have a bit of a break from touring. Yep. Um, and yeah, and that's actually where I met Becca, my partner. So oh, um, from know. there, like we ended up going on, um, I dragged her along and got her to come on tour with me. And she yeah, was nice. my, my sound person during the show. <laughs> so she, she hit play for me and I'd, <laughs> I'd basically do the, do the show with all the, all the props while she was kind of learning and getting on board with it herself, and cool. And, and now so she's you, a now she's a, um, an active performer as well. She's a she hooper. wasn't wasn't hooping before she met. No, you? we actually met because I, I was staying at a YHA by the beach for a while. It was kind of like a long stay place that a lot of people did their farm work down okay. there. Yep. So um, just a cool crew, and um, I'd uh, have a suitcase of props that I'd get out and just chuck on the lawn there and juggle and invite anybody else to come and play and. She came up one day and asked if I could teach her to juggle and she taught me how to do the Rubik's Cube in exchange and yeah. kind of, that's how we kind of first started um, flirting and yeah, <laughs> getting nice. to know each other. Um, she's from Vancouver for you guys watching at home. So I mm. uh, dragged her away from her um, backpacking experience and nabbed her up and we did a, ended up doing a partner visa. Yeah. But um Kind of after that stint of staying in Dunsborough for a while, we had a New Zealand trip booked and um, then, yeah, brought Becca along with that. Cool. And then kind of from there, bookings were slowing down and kind of we just wanted to set up base somewhere for a while. So, um, Byron Bay. Yeah. So we chose to start doing markets down around Byron Bay. Well, yeah. Basically, we're touring and we're like, let's do a market store because when we were – when we were touring, we were kind of like doing schools during the day and then trying to pick up other little crafty things we could do on the side. So I was just learning to make like when I was traveling, I used to like whenever I go through like Southeast Asia or something, I'd go and like collect all the little like hemp bracelets and things you could get from all those places, super cheap. So I just had wrists full of them. And then same thing, I used to kind of reverse engineer them and start to make them myself because yep. I was like, I'm going to learn all the things. Yeah, yeah. So and that's how you started learning like uh, rapping and macrame yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So just just from that collectively, we were like, we can make quite a few things. I learned, I learned how to crochet beanies because I had like a head full of dreads at the time and could never find a beanie that could fit my head through yep. winter. So I was like, well, I'll learn how to do it. And um, Becca could like crochet and knit as well. She knew how to sew. So we're like, collectively, we can do all these things. We can make like devil sticks out of like rubber and dowel kind yeah, of thing. Okay. We can sew juggling balls. And we're like, let's just do a little renegade market stall and kind of started off with that just to see if we could do it. And then um, that stemmed into wanting to get, um, or oh, through that as well, ended up learning like macrame. Um, and that went into like macrame plant hangers and got super into that. So mm -hmm. the store kind of primarily became that for a little bit and then learned macrame jewelry and then it kind of progressed into that, which then progressed into wire wrapping eventually down the track. Yep. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of like, what can we do to kind of just do our own thing and start totally. our own little business? And then like just started super rookie at the start, like a very yep. renegade little setup. And then until we kind of had an understanding of what to do and what it entailed. And yeah. then we invested into, found like some wholesalers for juggling supplies and then started building like, I started, used to make like fire props and stuff like that. Yep. So just kind of went more into the circus side of things and um, then turned into Juggle Hut was the name of our business. Yeah. And we started off doing markets around Byron, it's a super great market scene down there. So uh, um, obviously the uh, was it the monthly Saturday one, the big one. Yeah, Byron Bay so there was the Byron Bay market once a month. There was like um, the first like the first weekend we had like 
Brunswick heads and like Lennox head or something. Then like the second was the, the Shannon. Um, then there was like Mullumbimby on the third weekend of the month. And yeah, then Byron awesome. on the so fourth. So it was a roster. circuit. Every, and then it's like super cool market community down there as well. A lot of other young people doing their own small business kind of stuff. Totally. So most of my friends down there, because we moved down there not knowing anybody. Yeah. So most of our friends down there were also just kind of people doing their own businesses. So it was super inspiring to see everybody's different little projects and just mm-hmm. like a really good um, kind of showcase that you can just get out there if you, and, you know, create a product or an idea and make something of it and and yeah super inspiring so yeah we'd had a friend who had um rented out a warehouse for her business in the industrial estate so byron was kind of has a the arts and industrial estate they call it and it was very little industrial and a lot more arts and it was like (laughs) it was industrial zoning not residential but so many people kind of like lived in there who did the markets and they just run their businesses out of there and have a little shop front that's um the like when you're coming into byron that's that space where there's now like the big lifeline where the bp is you take left into there Yeah, Yeah, yeah yeah so um we uh, were super inspired by our, our friend doing it, so just wanted to walk, work towards doing that ourselves. And so we found one. When we did, it was awesome. a big, big leap of faith going into it, getting a warehouse, and we actually moved in there as well. Um, so probably wouldn't be a lot of them available anymore. Yeah, it was very, maybe very slim pickings now. Um, just and to get the a rent would be twice as much. Yeah, just get a rough idea. What uh, what year? Uh, so this would have been oh, gee, 20, uh, 25. 14, 2015 yeah. okay. kind of thing. Yep. Um, yeah, because I think I think when I met you, you were still in the warehouse, but it was yeah, very much the that, last year or I think that was our second so. warehouse. So we, okay, we yeah. had our first one and it was so good. Like we lived upstairs and as a juggler, just having an indoor controlled space with mega high ceilings, not have to worry totally. about it, like the weather outside or something. I could train a lot and just having all the props around me and people popping into the shop, I'd have a juggle with them and stuff. So really good for my own kind of training. And, okay, so you had a shop there stuff. as well. Yeah, okay, a, so a that's yeah, that was the first shop. Like we went from market stall to shop was kind of the, okay. the main basis of that. So sh- set up a shop and wanted to also have a space where we could hold workshops and weekly jams to just yep. kind of build the community around there. Yep. Um, and then we were in our first warehouse for about a year and then – set it up and then our landlord was like hey i'm having these tax problems and i've got to move back in there so we're like sweet (laughs) that sucks but found another place and it was better so it was one of those things that ended up being like a blessing in disguise and we got in there and kind of explained that situation to our landlord so we're like look we want to move in we want to set up we want it to be long term Mm -hmm. (laughs) because we want to kind of make this a, a thing and it was really getting to the point where we, I think we'd been there about 18 months or so and we're like we'd been doing the markets still. So going out there and getting the work out, doing the markets on the weekends, shop through the week. So it was super full on, but, you know, it was good work. Um, and and you're then, living what you love. Yeah, and we could, we could close the shop and go to the beach and stuff like that, yeah. like open um, at 10, so cruise yeah. start kind of thing. That's the best beach up from there too. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Could, you just cruise straight up that road pretty yeah, much, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Hit, um, oh, I can't the remember sun, what Sunrise? Yeah. Sunshine, sun, sunshine? Sunrise? Sunrise? Sunrise, sunshine, yeah. I think it's sunshine. Sun something. Yeah. Sun something just past beach the is a great beach. Yeah, like, yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, so, so, yeah, we... Um, Got set up and the business was going pretty, pretty, pretty good. And then the same thing happened with our next landlord. He's like, some stuff's gone down in my personal life and I've got to move back in. So uh. we couldn't find another space at the time. Um, we were planning a trip kind of like six months down the line to go and visit Becca's family in mm-hmm. Vancouver because both of our parents were turning 60. And so we're like, oh, man, we're going to have to like either sign a lease and then go away straight away. Like we couldn't find another warehouse. So we're going to have to like move into a house and just reassess everything. Yeah, yeah. uh, Whether we could do like house rent and a shop rent or just keep doing markets. But we're like, let's just kind of get rid of all of our furniture. Um, I'd lined up a festival in because we were at this stage we were taking the market stall to festivals as well and doing yeah, performance which there. is where I met yeah, Phil which is where we met down at Dragon Dreaming if correct. I'm correct down yeah. in um, New South Wales um, so yeah I'd lined up a festival a flow festival um, so flow flow arts is kind of the broad spectrum term for like the more the 
fire arts kind of spinning side of the circus scene. Yep. Just for anybody who's unfamiliar yeah, yeah, no, with the term of us talking about flow awesome. arts. Yeah. Um, so there was a flow festival in Cambodia. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's right. I yeah, called yeah. Free Flow. And it was a 10-day festival out um, on the, on Korong Island. Yep. And so we'd organized to have a stall there and do some performance stuff there as well and some workshops. And so we basically sold all of our furniture, had a little goodbye shindig at Juggle Hut. <laughs> nice. And um, just kind of planned to go traveling for a while and see where we landed when we get back. And I was... Um, did a working holiday in Vancouver. So we spent, we were away for a year. Yeah, um, which is why I saw you as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I went to Cambodia, did the festival there, sold most of our gear and then yep. um, sent the rest to Vancouver and then we kept traveling, went from Cambodia to Thailand, India, Nepal. Yep. Uh, highly recommend going through to Nepal if you have the time. Just yeah. do some trekking out there. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful no, spot. It's high on my list to <laughs> yeah. uh, do next. Uh, did love India, but uh, it was a lot. India is intense. <laughs> it was <But> a lot. <laughs> it was great. I, I, I went, um, bought a lot of crystals there. So <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Pushkar. which is great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went through there and then went to Vancouver and did a working holiday there and this kind of ties into how i got into wire wrapping so i'd yeah, always cool. i'd always liked wire wrapping when we were in vancouver oh no sorry when we were in cambodia i'd actually bought a wire wrap off a um a french guy there who was just had a little store set up um so that was kind of like the first wire wrap i own and then when we were in vancouver we both got jobs i was working just in a juice shop um it was great i finished early and could juggle yeah, awesome. <laughs> for the rest of the afternoon um and becca was working in like a bead shop and so she learned kind of like basic wire wrapping from there mm-hmm. to like because they sold stuff and did workshops and whatnot so just kind of like twisting the wire around the top of a quartz point kind yep. of thing um Brought some wire home one day and taught me how to do that. And then like I had the next day off and she left me at home with the wire and I kind of just spent ages staring at this piece that I'd got, looked up on YouTube, basic kind of weaving, but there were no like advanced tutorials for the style I wanted to learn at the time. So I just learned like basic techniques and then kind of just spent a long time staring at this one piece that I had (laughs) and reverse engineering it and just started going from there and then kind of progressing and looking at other people's work on Instagram and checking out where I wanted to be and using that same process we spoke at the start, you know. Totally. um, Understanding how to get to the desired result, just keeping an eye out for anybody posting work in progress pics and just putting out any information there and working about like about the process that they use and trying to take it on board and try things out. Some things work for you, some things don't and just just tackling it and having the patience to get get into it and – Suppose you had the time too as well. That's it. Being I'd, in I'd, another country. Well, I'd, I'd finish work kind of, um, and then just get home and wire up until, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I'd wire up until like one a.m. and then have to get up at five a.m. to go to work. I was like, I wasn't getting a lot of sleep <laughs> back then. <laughs> I <didn't> maintain that. <laughs> um, but yeah, smash that through and just kind of again, just that obsessive kind of personality if i if i know i'm going to pursue something i want to pursue it and want to get to a decent level of it because if you have taken the time to get to a decent level of something like that's where it starts to become really fun when you kind of totally have enough of an understanding you know and with you for music you know once you get to an understanding where you can kind of freestyle and start to make your own jams and get really competent with it that's when it really starts to get fun and really work with it and it's the same with anything so I really look forward to getting to that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, stick it through even even through some of the sticky like parts Do you feel at the, like you're at there? the start. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. <laughs> um, I was just curious because you know like a lot of times with people uh, like yourself and even myself, um, although, you know, like I have a lot of respect for my own abilities and stuff like I'm still – camera's gone off again but that's right. <laughs> I um, always want to be further. Well, that's – that's um, it comes back to again, like I we're gonna pause while I sort this we'll out. That out too. And we're back in. <laughs> All right. So, where were we in the grand scheme of? Um, I think sorry. we were you know, while wrapping in Vancouver. Yes. We'd had an awesome dinner together. We didn't tell anyone that, yeah. But, um, we did. We caught up in Vancouver, it was yeah. great. That was um, good. 
Yeah, a place called the Wallflower, if I remember correctly. Oh, was yeah. that place? Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, that was re- that was one of my highlights of that trip. That was awesome. Seeing was, me? Yeah, getting to <laughs> see you guys. It was nice. I had a nice little dinner in in Vancouver, and um, yeah. I was when I was there. I never really spent like I did like ins and outs, but I was always like in for a show or in yeah. for a party or whatever, and then and then out again, or then uh, like I mean, I spent a lot of ins and outs between Main Street bus station. That's about like yeah. that's my most. <laughs> Like, if you take me to Vancouver, I'm lost until you take me to Main Street bus yeah. station. Then I know where I am. I really enjoy Vancouver. It's a beautiful place. And oh, I, I really enjoy Vancouver, dot, 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 in the summer. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Never spent a winter in there. Yeah, so, no, not it's great in the summer. Yeah. And um, did you find- I didn't enjoy the wages to cost of living ratio. Mm. So my thoughts go out for those of you who are toughing it in that situation. And just makes me like not take for granted- this country? This country. How <laughs> good we've kind of got it in, in that aspect. Oh, yeah. I felt that when I came back. Like That yeah. was one of the big things when I came back. Um, the other big thing for me, which you might have found as well, um, I don't know how much you like tried to break into the festival scene over there, but for me personally, uh, like the festival application system over there, although they are available for some, um, there's not always a good chance that they'll even look at them. Yeah. Um, and like your spots are all taken. It's uh, it's more of a formality for mm. like a face. And I'm not uh, not saying that to diss anyone out there. It's just like, you know, they've got- Take that Vancouver. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they've got their places already. And I like came back over here and like, you know, got into one from an application, got in for two for an application and just and it'll snowballed from there. So um, it seems a bit more like kind of clicky. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's clicky everywhere. Yeah. Like it's clicky everywhere and, you know, it helps who you know and it helps being a part of it already and what you have yeah. to give to. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty of it, in Australia, they accept applications and New Zealand, sorry, um, and they look at them. And I'm not yeah. saying that they don't in Canada because uh, the whole reason I did it that tour, actually, the year, the year that I saw you yeah. went over there. 2017, I think. Yeah, that, that was, was over in Vancouver. Yeah, and the whole reason that was because Astral Harvest in uh, uh, just north of Edmonton in Alberta, they'd taken my application and they'd accepted me. So this is the most north I've ever been, man. Yeah. Once, once, you, <laughs> yeah. once you don't see a Tim Hortons anymore, <laughs> you know you're fucking north, eh? <laughs> like... <laughs> You're getting cravings for your donut bits. Uh, donut donut holes? Tim bits. Do- Tim bits. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Tim bits. Nah, man, but I kill for an ice cap. Like those. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't had them. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's just like a bad frozen iced coffee, but oh, like, nice. but they put so Frappe much sugar style. in it, yeah. and it's just <laughs> like, oh, it's so good. And you're like, just mad why it was like my my to go back to whistle my sea to sky treat every time. Yeah, nice. It's mad. <laughs> Big ice cap. Uh, Herman, her uh, like. Yeah, herb and cream cheese bagel or herb and garlic oh, the, bagel the, with the, cream cheese. The bagels in Vancouver mm. are great. Yeah, there's so um, good. a few good little Jewish bakeries there that have mm-hmm. great bagels and like knishes, which is something I was never. Mm, what's a knish? Um, it's kind of like a little pastry thing and it's like, you know, like a little doughy ball almost, but it's got like different fillings. So sometimes they're like potato and onion filling oh. or like mushroom and time or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that but just a little ball of deliciousness yep. you know? yeah yeah it was great um yeah so, so you were wire wrapping in vancouver well anyway yes. we'll just well yeah like and that's then eventually so, so yeah we weren't, we weren't sure like what we were going to do with juggle hut when we got back and yep. i'd really like taken a liking to wire wrapping as a new form of art um and um yeah, I kind of wanted to push that as well because I was always doing like macrame as a part of like our when we'd have our juggle hut store set yeah. up. Um, yeah, I remember you guys we, used yeah. to have the tree of life things. Yeah, and, yeah, and we'd always that. have have a, like a jewelry kind of crafty section. Yep, and um, wanted to try. I guess I guess when we got back. Okay, so what happened is when we were overseas, um, we were in Byron before, but kind of like had a lot of friends from the community up here in Brisbane. And um, had thought about coming up to Brisbane. Uh, Sideshow had opened up when we were over there. Mm-hmm. And so had seen kind of everybody. So Sideshow is a space in West End, like a little kind of arts um, venue, cafe thing. And, shout out um, to Sideshow. Shout out to Sideshow. And so when we were over there, um, Jaron, who was one of the 
the guys at the core of starting up Sideshow, was planning a trip overseas. So he'd messaged us and um, I basically- I forget that you, took, that you guys did that. Yeah, <laughs> so he was basically like, um, I've got a house, I've got a business. Do you guys want to come and step in while, um, while we're away and kind of help, help keep that going with, with Smiley, who's another great friend of ours who was um, running it at the time? running sideshow and so uh yeah came back in um yeah sort of helped out with the operations of sideshow for a while and so didn't really feel it you know obviously necessary to open up juggle hut in full swing again we're we're kind of super down with collaborating rather than kind of competing yeah sort of thing and just getting in there and there was a little shop in sideshow anyway so we just put some of our circus gear in there and we taught workshops in there and just helped out with the cafe and whatnot so through that process um we're we're out of that now we, uh jaren came back and kind of took took a took over the reins over there full swing and um just through that process, we'd really put Juggle Hut on the back burner and hadn't really bothered too much about staying on top of like replacing stock and building our stock back up kind of thing. Yep. Um, just doing a little bit here and there and then kind of was focusing more on doing workshops and performance in inside of like the circus realm kind of things and just wanted to really see if I could push um, jewelry making. Um, and yeah, I kind of made that my my main drive for the last uh, couple of years because I guess it would have been, yeah, 2018 when we got back. Yep. And like you said, now we are full swing in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> 2021. So I guess I've been, <laughs> I, I've been wire wrapping for now three and a half years. Yep. And for you in um, particular, like the last year has been obviously, um, you know, uh, you've, also gone through all of it, although we are very fortunate in this country to have only gone through it to a small portion of anyone else, anywhere else in the world. Um, but in particular, did that, did you like, like the fact that it gave you um, the time away from shows or like needing to practice or needing to um, keep that like constant um, productivity in the juggle realm for your workshops and stuff to just go balls deep in the yeah but definitely. I suppose you've been to, to doing be, that for a few to be years honest now. with you like the kind of what I do with projects is when I um you know, I, I do struggle with balance a little bit, um, which I'm Don't trying. <laughs> I'm trying to really get on top with that at the moment, yep. um, and it's been going good actually. So I've been enjoying kind of the balance I've got right now. Yep. Um, but I'll sort of like when I get something to a level that I'm comfortable that you know, like I was saying before, it's that that level that I consider high enough to be able to kind of like comfortably jam and be at a good level of progression where you can do it um, and start to implement your own ideas and things like that where Mm -hmm. you're not just learning by looking at other people's things and you can start to really like get more personal with it and make it your own thing. Um, So it's like until I get to that stage, I want to just kind of deep dive and get there really quickly and then I'll start to kind of balance it out a little bit more and and pick up the other things a lot. Yeah. But in terms of like how COVID affected um, that, so – Um, In amongst all of the sideshow stuff, um, my kind of business structure for Gematic, which is my other business, um, was gem shows. Um, So like, uh, yeah, kind of markets, uh, like one-off markets that are kind of around the place specifically for like gem dealers and lapidary artists and jewelers and stuff like that. Because I figured, well, hey, that's my demographic. Because I I put a lot of effort into choosing like pretty high-end gems and like sourcing stuff from particular areas that unless you're like really in the in the kind of industry or like in the know or just a gem nerd, like a rock nerd. (laughs) Yeah. um, you know, you you don't kind of you, you appreciate it for what it is, but don't know the kind of like, oh, that's well, that's one of these from that area kind of thing. Like, yep. oh, that's where, and then yep. I can justify like the price tag I've got on that yep. particular piece for that. So it's like kind of a better, a good demographic for me to kind of get into. Yeah, um, I just want to pause for one second. You said lapidry. Lapidry. So lapidry is the art of like cutting stones. Okay. So okay, um, cool. All right. I just want. I'd never heard it before, and I'm like, I'm. I've 
I've noticed a thing in myself is like, well, something I'm really working on is to not just like pass by things yeah, that people say, yeah. um, be like, okay, yeah, or yes, I know that person, or yeah, sure. that's cool. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to like really like, you know, like learning is the yeah, those, that's everything. Awesome. That's, that's an awesome thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, that's cool. again, it's just building your understanding and building your vocabulary. Totally. And like, yeah, the better understanding you have of what's going around you, the deeper you can kind of. Yeah, you get into things. So for sure. Awesome. Thank you for helping yeah, me clear that right. up also for you guys at home. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, I was doing that maybe like two or three gem shows a month or two gem shows a month when it was depending on how busy it was. Um, and, yeah, rather than going back into doing just kind of regular weekend markets, kind of choosing my audience a little bit better and then just trying to really just get online. Yeah. Um, and I'm really glad that I kind of, put that time into getting online because um, bring on COVID, I was like, oh man, everyone's going to kind of like stop unnecessary spending. Yep. All of my gigs stopped. That was just like I'd had I'd had solid gigs kind of booked in for quite a while. So it was pretty comfortable in that sense. And that just all went out the window. And then I was like, oh man, jewelry stuff. Like no one's going to buy kind of like stuff that they don't need in a time where they don't know what the economy is going to be like. Wrong. But yeah, well, it turned out <laughs> lots of people were still working from home and not being able to go out and spend money on all the other extra things that you do just in your general week to week when you mm -hmm. are going out. So it turned out great for going purely online for me. And um, yeah, I sort of, I was selling mainly, I, I had an Etsy store, but I was pretty much selling primarily through Instagram. Like I set up a little shop in my story highlights. Okay. So I just had all my highlights at the top of my page with my available pieces and were like, hit and the DMs to buy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, so you're um, just doing, uh, that, at that time it was just um, like just direct message contact. Yeah, yeah, and just okay. doing a PayPal transaction. Wow. And if they if they were like kind of uncomfortable doing that, I'd make an Etsy listing for them. But um, kind of like at the at the height of kind of lockdown sort of um, period, I was like, all right, let's do this properly, and I've kind of got a bit more time to set up a proper website. Yeah. So I did that. Got my partner Becca to help me out with the website because awesome. I was kind of like, I'm going to do this and started it and then just got swamped with custom orders because yeah. I was so busy. So I was like, you, Squarespace, outsourced. WordPress. Um, I use Shopify. Shopify. Yeah. Okay. I suppose that's more catered to what you're doing. It's it's good for having a shop. Is it, it is of, it within their platform or is it's your own URL still? Um, I so I've I've I've. Bought my own domain. Yeah, your own domain. Yeah. Sorry, that's what I was and, trying to say. And so it's just um, Shopify if you wanna, just helps you create the site. Yeah, so if you want to check out my stuff, go to www.gematic.com. That's mm -hmm. uh, G E M M A T I C. It is a made up word. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so check it out. My Instagram handle is the same, just at Gematic on Instagram. Yeah, um, I highly recommend. Yeah, but um, but yeah, it's good for a shop, and it links up all my social media shops as well. So I can okay. actually have a like a shop now kind of feature through Instagram and Facebook through my Shopify thing. So it cool. just makes it that kind of a little bit more professional and streamlined for for, for getting sure. my stuff out there. Um, you can then like track and trace orders and like exactly. really get and into look at the your analytics, analytics and yeah, stuff like cool. that. Yeah. Which I'm sure that like I, that's something I really enjoy yeah. these days. It's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> I love um, getting old and becoming a nerd. Hey, I know, right? I'm so I know, I know. It's everything, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, but why not, man? It's, yeah. it's, it's good. I mean, it's so uh, interesting, honestly, like between like my own creative stuff, like working out how I can always grow the festive collective brand and like, and just yeah. continue to um, like do like my ultimate goal is to continue to connect the community. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's awesome for the community and it only benefits me in the long run too, but like, it's really just um, like always looking at different ways I can do that. But I mean, through all that, like, um, my biggest thing has been working out then how to have things working behind the scenes for me. Yeah. So I've gotten really into like investing and like yep. cryptocurrencies and all that. And I just like, you know, just reading articles and like really taking my time with it after rushing it once upon a time mm -hmm. um, and like just enjoying that side of it now. And I have like a few homies and we just go back and forward constantly just about 
what's going on in the world yeah. or what this is doing well, or why that's affecting this and like yeah, yeah. totally well, well an interesting kind of byproduct of getting into the art of wire wrapping is kind of going down that nerd trail of all the minerals yeah the, the gems and yeah, mineral world cool. like figuring out because one like you figure out what's trending different yeah. minerals trend and stuff so i try and like figure out what everyone's going for especially in the states like over here it's a bit funny in the in the like I was saying, we got all the gem shows popping up and stuff, but they're primarily run by the Lapidary Clubs, which are generally like 60, 70 year old people. Yeah, kind it's a of different doing market. It. Yeah, so it's a very what your different, target audience different is. market. Yeah, and, and they're the people organizing a lot of them. Some of them are kind of like privately run, but a lot of them are like that. And a lot of the kind of other dealers and stuff in there. And then there's just like me and a couple of other young guns out there doing it. I know like one other wire wrapper kind of doing it as a business here. And then a couple of other people who are starting out. So we always try and catch up and have a little like nerd out session on what we've been making. But um, I've been lucky enough to connect to the, cause the community around it in the States has just gone off. Like all like the wire wrapping scene, like the gem and jewelry scene as a whole. So it's kind of, it's, it's almost similar to over here how, or over there as well, how the flow art scene is kind of tied into like the festival and art scene. Um, over in the States, there's a similar kind of connection with the gem and jewelry scene. Mm -hmm. So they'll have festivals. They've got a festival called Gem and Jam where they'll get artists like like Tipper and Thriftworks and everything to come and awesome. play. And then they've got like big display rooms of some of like the best of the best jewelers and everyone having stalls and like some of the best gem cutters doing like crazy cuts and stuff like that totally and so it's yeah it's like the festival kind of scene is is it's tied into the art scene over there where over here it's still kind of in that um that older kind of bracket yeah and there's a we're like the minority of the young guns and it's they see my work all these kind of like jewelers and stuff <laughs> that have been in the industry and they're all traditional jewelers and they're all like what the hell like because they know they all know like basic wire wrapping, which is just kind of like messy wires twisted around a stone, and they're all like, "Geez, we don't really like wire wrapping, but this is crazy." Kind of, right. kind of response. Yeah, awesome. Um, so it's like it's it's, it's yeah, kind of like so they're that also, backwards appreciation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, like, you just cover them backhanded compliments. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah like, exactly. Oh, that's weird, but. It, Looks all right. <laughs> yeah. But no, so it's 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 good because the all the gem shows love having me out there because it's something different of and course. um it's kind of pushing the envelope, which inside the scene that they're not aware of is quite like, you know, it's booming and totally. lots of people are pushing the envelope and and it's been great to see the progression and it's kind of happened with everything. Like if you look in the flow arts scene, that's happened as well. The amount of like tech that's out there in your in the flow arts has just increased tenfold in the last like five or ten years yeah due to internet sharing and just kind of the well, culture it. now has switched from like i was saying before of like that um you know almost demonizing putting an effort to something where now it's like embrace the age of the nerding deep diving into it and like really kind of getting into it kind totally. of thing which is which has been a great switch to see yeah, well, um, the internet. I mean, at the end of yeah, the day, yeah, like you got to just good, <laughs> the internet and our ability to travel and communicate yeah. in that way, which is through the internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> internet <Man>. for president. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, but yeah, like, yeah, it's just allowed us to excel in so many rights. And then it's also like, you know, given so many people a platform to realize that, um, you know, where. For forever, it's been thought upon that like, you know, you couldn't make a business out of these things yeah. or it wasn't accessible or there wasn't a market for it. But of course there's a market for it. There's 7.9 billion people on this yeah. planet. It's a fucking market for everything. Well, like, the, the other thing as well that, and I was kind of leading into this before yeah. I got uh, sidetracked again, <laughs> um, um, is I've been able to actually connect with a lot of, other artists from the States where there is a scene and an actual community around it, which doesn't exist over here. Like I said, I know maybe four or five other wire wrappers in the country that are doing kind of True. decent techie wire apps. Yep. Um, if you're out there and you're listening to this, hit me up on Instagram and say hi, because I'd love to connect uh, with any other artists. But, yeah, um, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, but I kind of got an invite from some, some guys over in the States who were doing like a, you know, set up like a, a um a chat through one of like the third party messenger apps like Telegram or something like that, mm -hmm. um and it's basically was a chat and it was kind of like a way to 
boost the boost everyone's Instagram algorithm where you every time somebody does a post, you share it in this group and everybody jumps on and slams it with some likes and some comments just to try and get it out there more to the public. And it was really cool. And just kind of through doing this um, became more than that, where it's now just like a little hangout of jewelers where we can be like, hey, what's everyone making today? Or like, hey, I'm trying out this new technique. I just got in these tools. Does anybody have tips for kind of doing this? And so it's been great as like a motivational thing for helping me like stay connected to the community and not feeling like I'm, isolated over here in Australia and um yeah just stemmed through somebody in the states who liked my stuff on Instagram reached out to me and invited me into that thing and this was like I think I think we've had this group going for a good two years now and it's just like a little hangout with some guys how many people strong um just out of curiosity it it kind of rotates uh people come and go but we've had a good kind of core group in there but there's I, I guess maybe like eight to ten or like okay, bet- yeah. between like five to ten yeah, active it's t- people super tight name, yeah some people drop out and beautiful. it's kind of like a you know everybody knows when you get busy and you can't stay on top of it you, yeah you know that's the first thing to let go and um it's fine for them to just come back in no questions asked just kind of get back in and say hi kind of thing so it's been a great little a great little kind of way for me to stay connected to the community um even though it doesn't exist so much over here in Australia. Totally. But I mean, through that comes opportunity, right? As well, yeah. at the end of the day, like um, like the whole festive collective premises and tagline that I like to do is uh, individually we survive, collectively we thrive. And like, yeah, yeah. and that's it. Like it's not, it's, we're not, it's not a competition. Like, exactly. It, yeah. By all means, not at all. That's, like the, that, That's another really interesting thing I've seen throughout all these different kind of community and this exists in every community sure. but these ones especially that are kind of like i guess i guess art based or you know a very kind of like art sharing kind of thing there's people who do, do it um who genuinely just love the the progression and creating and then there's people who really do it to fuel their ego <laughs> yeah and you see that a lot in these communities and um it, it definitely is there. It's there, like I said, it's there in every community, but in in like these ones where you end up with a very kind of like look at me kind of result at the end of it. Totally, um, it becomes very prevalent. So you do see that a lot, um, which kind of like like I said, it's in every community. When you're aware of it, it's good to steer clear of it, and then you you do find the people who are just in there, just who love creating art love inspiring people and love getting inspired by other people's art and that's sure. you know that's something that i really connect with it's For like sure. i love the the process of the progression i love making something because i i love seeing other people's art and that inspires me to create and yeah. it, like i love having something that i can kind of create that would then hopefully spark something in someone else to feel the desire to create for sure like at the heart of it that's yeah. that's really what i love about what i what i do is like cuz i love doing it and if i know that it can open those doorways for other people who may not be there yet yeah. so if you're if you're sitting there on the on the edge of wanting to try something the first step is kind of just getting out there figuring out what you need to get started and just doing it. And if you can find a community that's doing it, that's great. But if you're out there on your own, just start it and you'll, you'll, it'll all swing into place eventually. Totally. And yeah. reach out. Like, I mean, yeah, to, reach out. It, like I always say that to people and I do that with like the producing and stuff. And it's why I started the uh, producers meetup, which like literally was like my personal creative savior, savior last year yeah. in the lack of having the motivation of tours and gigs. Um, but like, yeah, just like having that, like you said, like having the community there um, and going in each time and eventually like it held me accountable to like creating yeah. songs. But more than anything, it was just so cool to like see other people get like that enthusiasm, like the um, the spirit out of it all. Yeah, and, and the um, drive you get for it, you know. For sure. And, like, it's especially like for so many people um, you see these days as well, like mental health is such a big issue and um it's it, I know it, I know for a lot of people it stands in the way of taking that first step, but Big if you time. if you get past it, like so many people, I because I see it happening all the time with people, um, you know, basically doing a post about a disclaimer of how much getting into these um, these different branches of art and whatever it is, but whatever you connect with and just how much of a big help it is for them for their mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Because, yeah, that's that's a massive thing in this day and age. Every second person suffering from some amount of anxiety and depression out totally. there. And, um, yeah, and just having those kind of things that, you know, get you in the flow state and living in the now just really, really help help that sort of stuff, I for feel. Sh- for yeah. sure. And backtracking just a quick second to anyone out there that is entering any of these art forms, but in particular everything you've said there, uh, and, and like is feeling enthusiastic about it, really wants to do it, but then does come across somebody who maybe isn't so receptive or not wanting to share them, just remember that that for every one of them, there's another five people like yourself that do want to share, that do want to be a part of it and yeah. want you to get whatever you're, you need to get out of that and to enjoy it and just put a smile on your face. Yeah. So like, don't be disheartened when you come across these people. Because, That's it. Yeah, every, everyone's because on their own journey, right? Eventually, At a stage of that journey. You meet one person like you, which makes you meet three people like you, the five. And then eventually I found like even myself. It's, it's um, a fractal community. <laughs> totally. And then after a certain amount of time, you re- then realize like, you know, you you thought you were surrounded by these people that you didn't want to be surrounded by. Then, then like someone says something to you about like someone's attitude and you're like, oh, wow, I haven't actually had that around me for years or you come across it like randomly and you're like oh and you look at it more objectively rather than letting it get to you because you're like wow that's not really around me anymore because you don't allow it to be around you exactly yeah um like and i just think that's like that's amazing and like do people just you know um it when you're not in that space or not around that community it's so easy to think that it never will exist for you yeah but it will just give it a second yeah yeah Again, patience. <laughs> yeah, patience. Totally. Yeah, patience on everything. That's that's like the biggest life lesson I've got from everything. Like, whether it's uh, embracing my own kind of journey that I'm on, or trying to like teach something to somebody else. Yep. Patience will get you through that. You know, if you don't get frustrated if it's not taking a while, embrace the journey. Yeah, totally. <laughs> get there eventually when you get there, and it's gonna feel good. Totally. Yeah. Well. In saying that, I reckon that's the perfect place to knock off. Yeah, awesome, man. Bro, Thanks for having me on board. Thank you great. for being the first episode of Beside Me. You are, in fact, beside me, and oh. I'm <laughs> I'm very grateful. You, you should you should do a solo one called I'm Beside Myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I already had that on the front of a newspaper once. <laughs> <Nice. so. laughs> I happened to like drop it in um, at the like a when I got back from overseas and I like was staying in Mulaney, I just like hit the no- local newspaper up about a show I was playing nice. and I happened to like <laughs> drop it in, in the interview just as a joke. And then it's like the newspaper came out and it was a giant picture of my face and it just said <laughs> beside himself. And I was like, Oh no, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> oh, but uh, yes, it's very, um, very me. So I'm, uh, yeah, it's awesome. I'm proud of it. but most of all, like, thanks man. Like I oh, wanted no, to do the my first pleasure. episode with you. We have nice chemistry. I'm super proud of everything you've achieved since I've known you and then just think your story is fucking interesting. Awesome, um, I appreciate so, that. Man. And the, the diversity of everything. So keep smashing it. And um, I have no doubt we'll do another one of these down the track. For sure, man. Sounds good. Cool. Thanks for listening. Peace <laughs> out, y'all.